Good morning. We're delighted that you have chosen to join us today for this study of God's Word. And we would like to invite you as well to join us in worship today at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ. We will gather this morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, followed by worship at 9.50. We will come together again this evening at 6 o'clock for evening worship, and then we gather on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock for midweek Bible study. We would love for you to come and be our guest at any or all of these upcoming services at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been engaged in a study entitled Jesus the Messiah. And if you've missed the lessons the last two Sundays, you can go to youtube.com and search Pyburn Street Church of Christ and find those lessons. But today we're going to pick up where we left off in our study last week in talking about the mission of the Messiah. You know, it's no wonder that over and over in the Gospels, we hear Jesus reminding his disciples about his mission. At times, his statements were general, such as, I am come to seek and save the lost. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But at other times, he told stories about lost sheep, coins, and sons in order to illustrate points. But toward the end of his ministry, he began to reveal things more specifically. Specifics about how all of this seeking, saving, and calling would be done. There would have to be a death. A sacrificial lamb would have to be slaughtered. There would have to be blood. His blood that would have to be shed. He would be that sacrificial lamb as Peter sets forth in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28 is one of the most poignant conversations that Christ ever had with his disciples regarding this matter. Having confessed him as Messiah and Savior of the world, Peter was astonished to hear his master's response. True, he was the Son of God, and the fact that he would be the bedrock for the church. But if Peter thought that was all there was to it, then he was sorely mistaken. That was only half of the equation. There was work still to be done before a kingdom could be established. Satan had to be slain, territory had to be conquered, the gates of Jerusalem lay ahead with the gates of death just beyond. However, for three long years, Peter had waited impatiently for his leader to take the throne. So what was all this talk about dying? Could he not just triumphantly walk into Jerusalem and proclaim himself the Messiah, throw out the Romans and let everyone live happily ever after? Well, since when did a crown's price tag come in the shape of a cross? There was obviously some mistake, and this spokesman leader was going to correct it. The rebuke, though, came privately, but it was one that was very strong. He said, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Well, in an instant, Judah's lion roared forth in response. Peter's words were devil's talk, a temptation, really, and they had to be silenced. Now, Jesus had already heard a similar taunt on the Mount of Temptation. In Gethsemane, it would be offered again, and such nonsense left room for only one response. Jesus looked to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. But then we come to the mission of the Messiah. If Christ's mission was death, then his message was that of life. John's beautiful narrative reveals this great truth. We think about the words of John 1 and verse 4, where it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. To Thomas, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. To the hungry multitudes, he presented himself as the bread of life. In John 6, 35. To thirsty Samaritans, he offered the water of eternal life. In John 4, 14. To a grief-stricken Martha, he encouraged, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. His message was one that was very simple. 
life eternal and life abundant. Now the prophets had foretold it. 700 years before Jesus' birth, Isaiah had penned this very promise. But now, Emmanuel, let there be life and there was life. Let there be light and there was light. For those living in the shadow of death, glory had finally dawned to them. For all those who stumbled around in the darkness, a great light had now come. Now death could be destroyed, life and immortality could be brought to light through the gospel message, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 10. It was this gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, that at long last had set free this hope that the Messiah was bringing. Down through those dark corridors of time, we see angels and prophets had sought out the hope. They had looked for a glimpse of this glory. But now the day had dawned, the morning star had arisen, and this prophecy had come true. We see that the sun was now shining in its glory. Jesus, as the Son of God, came delivering a message of truth. And these words were authoritative. They were spirit and these words were life, John 6:63. 6, but even Peter realized this amazing fact. Once when others turned their backs and Jesus had asked the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Well, very quickly and unashamedly, Peter had blurted out, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, John 6:68. 6, and then years later, a more reflective and mature apostle encouraged those pilgrims that were scattered abroad in 1 Peter 1, 23-25, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Even though Christ's life-giving message led directly to his death, the truth, friends, did not die at Calvary. This was only the old cross road. This was the crossroads, if you want to use that terminology, between that life of bondage to sin on, this, on that side of the cross and the crossroad of life being set free from that sin through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ through the blood that he shed on the cross, on this side of the cross. This was not only a starting place, a point of departure for the journey ahead. Joseph of Arimathea may have placed a mangled body into the tomb, but hope was not buried along with that body, for there was a promise. God had sworn that the Messiah would not be abandoned to the grave, his body would not see corruption, he would be raised to life, that there would be witnesses to this, and that the message would be preached to all the world. Friends, the resurrection became the focal point of the first century church. It was Peter's message on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It was his message before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4. It was his message to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. In epistle after epistle, Paul magnified the resurrection, showing that without it, man's existence was worse than pitiful. To a wavering church in Corinth, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Friends, Jesus had been right. He was the resurrection and the life, and those two facts were as inseparable as as Mary and Martha were his sisters. If death was the end, then Lazarus was gone forever. A loving sister could not accept that fact, but in reality, she didn't have to. The Messiah she knew and trusted 
was going to wake her brother up from his slumber, and the power was his, for soon he would become the first fruits of those who slept. And if the resurrection were not miracle enough, we see that Jesus repeatedly demonstrated through miracles that he is the Messiah. In the Old Testament, miracles had long been associated with God's creation, salvation, and protection. Genesis opens with a miracle. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The patriarchal age included many miracles, not the least of which was the birth of Isaac, which is oftentimes seen as a type of the promised child. Well, likewise, God's Spirit was at work during the Mosaic Age in the parting of the Red Sea, the providing of manna and quail, the protection of Israel from her enemies, and even after the conquest, we see men like Gideon, Samson, and Samuel performing miracles by the sight of God. Well, during the time of the united and divided kingdoms, we see divine demonstration coming through in a variety of ways. We see this through the prophets. And who can forget the likes of Elijah and Elisha and healing the sick, raising the dead, and, and challenging those prophets of Baal. Thus, as a miracle worker, Jesus stood in the Old Testament tradition of a spirit-equipped agent of God. Whenever we come to the ministry of Jesus, we find him performing a wide variety of miracles. Everything from restoring sight to the blind, healing the lame, bringing those who had passed away back from the dead. This power that he displayed was there as further proof that he had come from God, that there was a divine nature to him. Well, you might imagine that such miraculous power would have convinced even the most hardened of cynic. After all, John believed that just reading about the Messiah's miracles would produce faith, as we see in John 20 and verse 30. But not all desired that same illumination that Nicodemus sought. Others among the Pharisees attributed Jesus' power to Satan. Their charge, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons, Matthew 12, 24. Well, to this charge, Jesus responded with his most severe rebuke. And, and such falsity, especially in the face of clear and incontrovertible evidence, was sheer blasphemy. Blasphemy against the very spirit through whom God was working. Well, had the lie gone unchecked, testimony about the Messiah would have been jeopardized. And when eyewitnesses lie, subsequent generations are robbed of the truth. But the occasion of this blasphemy stands as one of the clearest statements as to why Christ performed miracles. It might be surmised that Christ's miracles, especially those of healing and compassion, were demonstrative of altruistic love for mankind. If God loved the world enough to send his Son, then would not the Son demonstrate his love in a miraculous way? Well, the answer is most definitely affirmative, but not entirely satisfactory. In reality, the bulk of Jesus' miracles, whether in the form of healing the sick, raising the dead, or casting out demons, conclusively demonstrated his authority over Satan. Satan is the strength behind all pain and evil. Thus Jesus questioned, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first bind the strong man? In casting out demons by the Spirit, Jesus demonstrated that the reign of God had come. Now Luke's narrative also reveals the same truth in Luke 10, 17 through 20. After commissioning the 70, they returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. To this, Jesus responded, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Obviously, miracles proved his ministry's power over Satan's complete power. Friends, the practical beauty of this power is seen in its impact on God's scheme of redemption. The angel promised his name shall be Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But sin's chains were the property of Satan. 
Only the Messiah held the key that would release those chains. And by coming to earth and spoiling the strong man, Jesus proved that he was worthy to lead his people to victory. Friends, we thank you for joining us for our program on this Lord's Day morning. And we pray that God blesses you with a wonderful day.